All right, what's up, Fremen? This is Stephen, Josh, and Jake from Phantology with our episode covering Dune. We are live from the desert planet of desert planet of Arrakis with our review of Dune. So, uh, Dune is written by Frank Herbert back in 1965, and Josh and I recently, kind of recently, read it. Jake is uh, more of a little more of a experience with Dune. So, cause, cause you read the book a little bit ago and you've kind of been, you've grown up with the movie at I've least, right? I've grown up right? with the like, movie. Yeah, I've read the a, book. Yeah, this is a story well, you're familiar with. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like you may be more of a fan than uh, Josh and I. We, we have some yeah. more uh, hot takes or ice cold takes depending on where you stand on the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to hear uh, <laughs> your guys' opinions, I guess. <laughs> Uh, you're gonna you're gonna hear him. So, uh, okay. So, so this book has a, has a big legacy to it, right? Written back in 1965, this is over 56 56 years ago now, if, I, if my math is right. And it's kind of billed as like the best selling science fiction ever. I think there may be some similarities even between like Lord of the Rings is to fantasy as Dune is to science fiction. Is that warranted at all? Um, I feel like. Lord of the Rings is so like universal to fantasy where it's like everything goes back to that. Whereas sci-fi has a lot of like founding fathers, if that makes sense. Okay. And Dune being one of them. It, it's like, interesting because Dune has more of a fantastical element than a lot of the sci-fi I'm used to. Yeah. You know, it's really more sci-fantasy than like yeah. science fiction. More yeah, of like, uh, like the, the space opera as Sanderson would say from his lectures. Yeah, whereas Asimov is more of that founding father of like the hard sci-fi and that kind of stuff. But yeah, definitely Dune is is super influential on um, science fiction and fantasy. So I know, uh, Josh, you kind of you had some thoughts on this, like influences on things like Star Wars, et cetera. Expound. Yeah, yeah I mean, I had I had heard that Dune was. Um, was had an influence on star wars but i always thought it was kind of like okay well there's a desert planet and it's um you know a protagonist going through a desert planet that's kind of like what i thought it was just kind of generally but no sure. it's like a lot more um it's are, are we doing spoilers right now or should we keep it spoiler free no we're gonna just do spoilers i think this okay. is gonna be one episode yeah i mean just even with um like the kind of evil um evil antagonist throughout most of the book being related to the protagonist you know something like that mm -hmm. was i feel like directly inspired star wars um okay. and then kind of this fantastical element of like the force and these these benny jesuit uh yeah. powers yeah that are and then being nebulous. inducted yeah exactly being inducted into secret society where you're going to learn how to um, use this magical force that you have inside of you you know like there's a lot of similarities that I feel like directly inspired um, Lucas and it's not even like a secret right like I think George Lucas has talked about how Dune um, was mm -hmm. pretty influential on him oh yeah yeah I, I, th I don't think it's a secret at all the, the influence that Dune has had I mean things that there's a lot of references in modern things like Jake, you're an Adventure Time fan. I know there's an episode of Adventure Time where they kind of go down to the the Dune world a little bit. I don't know how that works. I haven't seen the episode. I haven't uh, seen some, that There's episode. an episode. Oh, you haven't? Oh, I don't think I guess so. Not not a real fan then. Okay. I there's like Adventure Time, but I'm not I'm not like an expert on it. Or okay. There's like an episode of SpongeBob where they're doing stuff with sandworms. There's an episode of Chuck, one of uh, our longtime favorite shows where they go dressed as a, as a sandworm. And then even things like Wheel of Time. I, I mean, Jake, you're, you're a big Wheel of Time fan. Would you say there's some influences there? Yeah, when I was saying like it's influenced sci-fi and fantasy, I think in general, the idea of the like, the wild kind of primitive yet wise nomadic race or a group of oh, people yeah. is like very um, inspired by the Fremen. We got the Aiel in Wheel of Time probably the wildlings in uh, song of ice and fire right that that's a trope that pops up everywhere we we were just reviewing one of the anthony ryan books 
the sequel to one of the sequels yeah. to Blood Song. And we kind of talked about the same thing, like this tribe of folks that are out there. And at first glance, you think, oh, they're just these nomadic people who are, are more backward, backwater primitive. And then you get to meet them. And then it turns out they are you know, fairly advanced in ways you wouldn't expect. Uh, just a trope that honestly, I think is maybe a little overdone, but uh, even yeah, like, Dune, the, like the Northmen and First Law are kind of like that. Oh yeah. Northerners. Um, yeah, I don't know if they uh, really have they're, the same. They're not a, <laughs> they are pretty backwoods. Yeah, after, but after but all. you yeah. do. But they are able to like really stand up against the Union. You know, yeah, who yeah, should yeah. on favor. Yeah, um, and, and Jake, you brought this up in chat as well. But even how much I feel like Paul influenced Rand with uh, yeah. with turning kind of into a harder character and like not really letting emotion influence him even so as to the point where he's like going to be comfortable betraying his own mother who wants nothing but the best for him. Um, and Rand, I don't want to spoil wheel of time, but he Rand gets harder and harder throughout the series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, that that's a really good comparison. I was thinking more along the lines of just the focus of this chosen one character dealing with the weight of being a chosen one mm. i think like to me that's one of the most compelling parts of uh the wheel of time and uh dune is like in dune paul is he's he has this sense of uh foretelling at the beginning like it's stronger and he knows there's this jihad coming and he knows he's he's like can play a central role in that and he doesn't want to but like everything he does is like leading towards that and it's just this huge weight on him that like affects his character growth the whole time so we're going to talk about uh paul and the other characters uh, specifically coming up here in a second uh, i do want to point out there are several sequels to dune i don't know that any of us have read any of the sequels no i i never have i've always wanted to but just yeah. i heard they get kind of weird but i really want to dive into them <laughs> On, on Discord, we were told that the next the next book was more of like a direct follow-up. Mm -hmm. And there were some discussions of whether that should be included at first or when, when it was first published. So maybe the next one um, is worth reading. We'll, we'll see um, how, what our TBR list. Yeah. I, I don't know at what point, but I know the, the original author, Frank Herbert, um, wrote, it's like three or four, maybe five. And then his son started writing them with another. He author. wrote five, and then uh, his son Brian wrote a few more. Yeah, and it sounds like those ones are kind of scoffed at, like just that, a money grab almost. The, yeah, this kind of frustrates me. It's part of the reason I haven't really read the the sequels is because Frank Herbert never really finished it definitively, from what I understand. But then the continuation kind of is terrible, from from what I've heard and like contradicts previous stuff. So it's like, mm. do I want to read and then stop where it's like canonical or yeah. keep going, you know, like I would want to keep going, but. Yeah, I did a little, a uh, little bit of a Wikipedia deep dive into what the sequels brought. I mean, I didn't, I didn't spoil too much of the plot with me in that. I just wanted to kind of look and see what I might expect from the future books. So I think, I think they could be interesting. Um, in addition to the books, there were movies. Well, there was one movie that sounds like you've seen. I haven't, I've not seen. And then there's like a mini series on the sci-fi channel. And then in October, in a few months from now, we are finally getting the, the, the big movie that we wanted to have last year, but got delayed because of COVID. Yeah. The whole, I feel like every adaptation of Dune is just cursed. The first movie, <laughs> I think the the reason it didn't go new didn't do very well is because like the studio made them cut so much out and then it just wasn't mm. like a like and also i don't know if it's budget issues but i remember watching it thinking oh this is just an old movie like the graphics aren't that good it's an old movie but it came out after star wars and the effects are significantly worse <laughs> than star wars yeah <laughs> daniel green has a really funny video about the the movie have you guys seen this I haven't. Um, I, I don't know. No. I might have. I, yeah, I probably have. He he goes through and talks about the good and bad about it, but apparently, mm. I think there's like a rat duct taped to a turtle or something that they just straight up like 
duct taped to on. To a cat, yeah. Or, oh, yeah, to a cat, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have seen that. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that part in the movie or the book, so I, I need to rewatch it. Well, it, it's not that. a part, like, yeah. in, the, in the book. Um, yeah, sounds low budget to me. <laughs> but, but, and then uh, the miniseries on sci-fi I heard is, like, really good story-wise. Like, they don't have, like, the issue of, like, parts of the story being cut out but then it's mm-hmm. sci-fi you know the budget's just not really there and yeah and now we have covid coming to strike again it's like the defense against the dark arts position of <laughs> sci-fi adaptations <laughs> and i think you were you were saying that if this next movie that's coming out in october if it does well then it's only the first half and if it does well then they're gonna film the that's second half heard. yeah which is like why would you why would you only plan on making one half of a yeah. story? Seems risky. So I, I will say before we get started too much, because there are some things I'm going to be critical on, I like totally understand why this book has its um, legacy status. You know, I think that it, it influenced so much and that it r- did a really good job of a lot of things and like introduced a lot of tropes that we've talked about. So there are Mm -hmm. some things that definitely like did not work according to my taste. And uh, Jake, I'm sure you'll tell me why I'm wrong and listeners will (laughs) tell me why I'm wrong on discord, but I was like, before we get too critical, I really think that this book does deserve its uh, legendary status in in literature. Yeah. Well said. I, I, I'm kind of with you, Josh. I have some criticisms, but you got to look at it through a historical lens So uh, 65, I think that there's a lot uh, to draw from here. Obviously people have over the years. Before we move on into the actual like discussion of the book itself, when I was doing uh, some research for the episode, I came across this influence in Name of the Wind, which is my favorite book. And I had never even realized this was a thing. So there's a quote from when he goes to, when Quoth goes to uh, hear the story from the storyteller named Scarpy. Another girl asks Scarpy for a story and she says, quote, I want to hear about the dry lands over the storm wall, about the sand snakes that come out of the ground like sharks, about the dry men who hide under the dunes and drink your blood instead of water. And that was kind of like a cool little Easter egg to find. I had no yeah, idea that nice that was. Yeah, that's a nice deep cut. Yeah. I, I don't remember that at all. That's awesome. Yeah. So there it is. Patrick Rothfuss as well, influenced by Dune. Okay. Let's talk about it. So I thought we'd first kind of talk about the world building because I thought that was one of the stronger aspects of the book. So the planet of Arrakis itself, Dune, the desert planet, water is everything. They have all these kind of cool things that revolve around this this ecosystem, this desert ecosystem. And uh, like, did, did this work for you guys? I, I thought there were a lot of cool things here. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll let Josh go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was great. I really like how it influenced the culture of this nomadic tribe where, you know, even crying for the dead was something that like you just Uh didn't do um, really unless like it was extreme reverence and that you got the the water from the body if you killed somebody that like was the main loot that you got. Um, I liked how uh, even having the trees outside was like a status symbol that inspired like hope in some and anger in others. Mm-hmm. There are just so many little details about the world building that um, that tied back into how key water is. Um, one thing I, one criticism I have about the world building is as soon as you leave Arrakis, like there's this, there's hints at this much wider universe that's been settled, yeah. and there's like a lot of politics, but none of that world building I feel like is done very well. Like there's an emperor that is, but you don't really get the whole scope of how big the empire is. You get that it's probably pretty big. At least I didn't, I didn't pick up on it. Um, I'm with you there. And yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I feel like as soon as you leave Arrakis, which there's a sizable portion of the book, I don't know. I would guess probably around like 20% that happens off of Arrakis. And I feel like that world building wasn't, done uh, nearly as well as yeah it starts off in Kaladin and then there are these kind of shots almost of of uh, the Baron Harkonnen off, off with his folks and honestly I can't really tell you where they are I, I'm sure that real experienced readers of the series will be able to say like oh yeah he's in this place in this place 
but uh, the details are so vague here that it never really gets built out. I feel like, I mean, there's lots of different aspects of world building. And I think like the actual world itself is such a minor part of that. Like when you look into, well, first to address uh, Josh's critique of the, how large the empire is. I mean, you have the lands rat, right? That is like a Congress of worlds. So okay. there's, there's at least like 50 to hundred worlds and the, the empire, you know? Um, and I, I mean, I admit, I'm not sure where thinking back, like, I don't know where the Harkonnens were like during their scheming um, outside of them being on Arrakis and that part of it. But also like that doesn't really play into the plot. So I don't know why that, you know, it's not a big focus. The focus is like the, the plot is surrounding Paul and Paul is on Arrakis and it's also surrounding um, the spice, which is central to Arrakis. So like, that's where all the, the world building right, really needs right, to be. Right. Outside of that, I feel like the political world building and the historical world building is huge with the, the Bene Gesserit. I mean, they, they leave it pretty mystical. So you don't really know like how they have their powers or like what all they can do. Definitely. But yeah. which, which, yeah, which is how, why it's like more sci fantasy than, than mm -hmm. the hard sci-fi. But then also with the whole, the Mintat system, how there, there was this war thousands of years ago where they eliminated all AI because of some mm -hmm. uprising and now they need just these mentats that can do all the computations in their head. I feel like, mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I feel like it's that all that stuff like is way bigger and way more impressive than not knowing what planet Baron Harkonnen is on. Yeah. I, I that was interesting. There's no robots. Like this is sci-fi. There's with no robots, no computers. Yeah. But, but that was, that was what Jake said, which I really agree with that. You have these, people that are kind of like robots that took the place of robots yeah mm -hmm. you know um yeah, I thought that have, was cool yeah which again and that that's all powered like because they don't have ai or robots um they needed to rely on these mentats and they rely on the spies again like it's all like dune is the central part of the empire's whole economy so to me, it makes sense that that would be where yeah, the- But, but again, <laughs> then it's kind of like why, it's kind of weird that they just weren't too concerned about the the functionings of, of Arrakis. You know, like the emperor was like, oh man, we got let this situation get out of hand pretty quickly. And then he like stepped in, but for a but while were, there- They were super, like they, the whole thing was, they wanted to, well, the Harkonnen's plan was, like, well, I can't remember if this was their actual plan or what the Duke thought his plan was, but basically they wanted to hoard their own spice so that way they could sell it at a price. Like right. A higher they price, to have the power and, and there. Get, get people addicted. But even just having this Duke, like that wasn't totally faithful, you know, it seemed like for, 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 um, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Like, I feel like for such an Iraq as being such an important part of the em empire, they kind of let it get out of hand with, with the Duke and him being not really faithful to the empire and like then um, doing the whole coup attempt. And he was faithful to the empire. The Duke was. Well, well it was more, it was more like the oh, empire. Wait, are you talking about Leto or sorry, are you talking about the Atreides or Harkonnen? No, uh, Duke L Leto. Paul's. He was, he was, he was loyal to the empire. The emperor just colluded with the Harkonnens to yeah. get rid of them. Basically, oh yeah, we'll set this up. This is a position he'll want because it's Arrakis, and then we'll kill him, get rid of him, and I mean, and then the Harkonnens were obviously kind of double, double playing everyone. But well, he yeah, he, so but he was the arch nemesis of Har of the Harkonnen, right? Like that's yeah, just well, their yeah, their families. They, yeah, so I mean, I don't know. It it, it it sounds like just the politics in general were were not built out enough for you, Josh. Like it seemed like it was too much of a small scale when it was a a conflict that ex, ex, was expansive over 
like you were supposed to believe there's this huge conflict but we only saw it from arrakis we didn't get the other stuff built out more is that kind of what you're thinking yeah i yeah i guess um i don't know <laughs> yeah i i do think it was a little it was so focused in on laser focused on arrakis for most of the time with paul and the fremen and, and that was kind of like most of the at least the middle part of the book and then all of a sudden at the end down comes the emperor and we've got a few shots of of uh, the Harkonnens colluding and, and the emperor has been in the background. We always know it's a bit of a thing. And then all of a sudden it's like, bam, okay, here we are. We're, you know, we're, we're fighting the, the big thing, but it's like, ah, has this been set up enough? Yeah. I feel like on, so I feel like a big thing is I, I'm going to want to reread this book in like a year or something. And I feel like I'll enjoy it a lot more on a reread because I'll be able to pick up on a lot more of these things on my second time through. So I think if you had yeah. grown up like with this plot and kind of knowing what it was about, then when you go in to actually read it, you'd be able to pick up on a lot more things. There's a lot of foreshadowing and prophecy throughout yeah. that I think as first time readers, we were more like, uh, I don't know what that is. I mean, you always try to file those things away, but in this one, like it was intentionally written to be uh, quite, uh, you know, hard to pick up on at, at first is a little nebulous. And then I think, yeah, like you say, going back through, could be good. Yeah, I, I feel like the, the biggest weaknesses, in my opinion, of the book are um, it is like kind of confusing. It's not really like in a lot of different ways. There's lots of plot stuff going on and different bursts, and it's hard to know what is going to be important going forward. And then you're like, oh, this is why that happened. Also, mm -hmm. um, especially for audiobook listeners, the, um, the audiobook is way bad. The, well, just the fact that they'll, it's like this. Um, it's like this dramatic recording with lots of different voice actors contributing, yeah. which is but, but, nice, but then you don't get this. You don't know who's talking all the times and they will change who's voicing different times. Like I, the Baron has at least two different voices that switch kind of depending on like the mood he's in or something. And, and in the actual book itself, it is kind of confusing because you'll get it's not like um, third person limited where this chapter is from this person's perspective, all mm -hmm. the internal dialogue I know is attributed to this person. It's very much within the same paragraph you could have, oh, now I'm getting Lady Jessica's thoughts. Now yeah. I'm getting Paul's thoughts. And, and so that can be jarring. And then also I feel like the other weakness is um, the, the falling action of the, of the story is, is a little quick. There's no falling <laughs> action. <laughs> there is none. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, there is. <laughs> oh, not much. <laughs> he gets it's married. Like a, yeah. I mean, I mean them them attacking the emperor and him like. I thought that I would have classified that as the climax, not the falling action. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's. <laughs> I meant I meant the climax is a little rushed. Yeah. Well. Oh well, yeah. yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 The climax um, is rushed, and then there is no fall, falling yeah. action. It's just. It yeah. 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 yeah take that back sorry <laughs> mix up but but apart from that i feel like going back to what we were talking about before the political intrigue in this book is amazing like all of the all this it reminds me a lot of like game of thrones or wheel of time with all the political machinations sure. you have you have all this all these factions that have different goals and they're playing off of each other and then you have these people who are caught between them like Lady Jessica caught between being a Bene Gesserit, but also loving Leto, Paul. I mean, Paul himself is, is his whole character is supposed to be stuck between these two worlds of being mm -hmm. a, trained as a Mentat, but also being the Kwisak. Kwisak Haderach, yeah. I do remember, my, my family like the has this joke where, where they'll just make up new names that rhyme with it. So I, at this point, I can't remember <laughs> what is, at one point it was the, Quiznos hacky sack, <laughs> Quiznos hacky sack. <laughs> but anyways so and so you have like uh, the Harkonnens with their goals the emperor with his goals the spice guild and then the Bene Gesserit and especially like and all the this, Fremen let and alone. The, yeah and the and the Fremen and then mm -hmm. really House Atreides is just like being pushed around this whole time until Paul realizes his potential I don't know I think the political intrigue is amazing in it but maybe Maybe with a reread, I, you guys would appreciate it more. Yeah, I think I would need a reread because a lot of it's being presented. 
you're, you're being introduced to people really quickly without a whole lot of backstory. And then you kind of get yeah. that more as it goes on. And so the intro you're talking about happens right away. And I'm trying to learn who these guys are at the same time the intrigue is happening. So I do think a reread once I know, if I could go back and say, okay, I know, you know, who this player is and, and what they are trying to do, et cetera. And now I see what they're saying here, what this means and all that. I think a reread would be really and, nice. <laughs> and the thing is a lot of the politics, especially at the beginning of the book, doesn't really have anything to do with Paul. And yeah. so, so it's kind of hard because you're following along mm. Paul, who's meant to be like the protagonist but he's not really a part of any of that. Yeah, Paul does like nothing until the he's, end of book one. Well, and when I say book one, a, I mean part one. Yeah. He's he's not like a part of the actual politicking, but it's it's all affecting him. Yeah, but you more tend to like see things through his eyes. There's a bunch of prophecies about him. He puts his hand in the box. That's about as much as he does. In the I first. mean, he'll, he'll like catch an assassination attempt against himself. Yeah, there was that. Yeah, but also this is like a huge cast story you know, at that point, it isn't supposed to be like, I'm Paul, I'm going on an adventure. Yeah. You know, it's more like- it's But, more but like that's what it turns into. Like, yeah, it turns the, into that, that, but the first part is more like a Shakespearean political right. play. But, but that's kind of the jarring nature of it, is the first part, there's all this politicking, which you don't really have, like, care. I, personally, I didn't care about any of the characters that were politicking. You know, I was didn't know who they were. You I wasn't attached to them. I didn't really care, care who wins. Like the thing about the Song of Ice and Fire is you care about all the characters, even if you hate them, you still like care about their actions. Because mm -hmm. you've been the, with them for so long. Yeah. All, all the politicking is under the framework of, you know, the Reverend Mother has said, oh, now that you guys are going to Arrakis, Paul's father's going to die. Like she said that Paul has this premonition that that's going to happen. So all the politicking is framed in this way. Like, w can you trust this person? Can I trust this person? Who's yeah. going to be prayer? But, so like, but, to me, that, that causes this pay, huge tension. But the payoffs weren't even that good with it. Like you just kind of found out and it wasn't surprising or like. So, yeah. So here's the thing. So I, I'm, I'm with you, Josh, because like Jake said, they say right at the beginning, Leto's going to die. So, you know, there's, there's zero tension there, right? You could say the tension is, okay, how is he going to die? What's going to happen? But then right away, Dr. Yahweh, or however you say his name, says, like, you get his internal dialogue. He's like, I'm the traitor. I'm, I'm the guy who's going to do it. So you know, as the reader, not only what's going to happen, but how it's going to happen. I mean, you don't know all the details. But I, feel I, like I, my don't, I don't like that. I, I did not like the way that played out because I just had no tension. I, I feel like the story would have been much more compelling to have a twist or something. I feel like the opposite. You you just totally accepted the Reverend Mother that Luke was going to die, or Leto was going to die. Yeah, because the whole well, he did. I mean, I wasn't fooled. Well, I know, but like it wasn't like, oh, is this really going to happen? Or but there's not? there's no there's nothing to indicate that won't happen. There's yeah. no like false narrator well, or it's, unreliable it's narrator. It's the whole like I think it's it's like so beautifully done with tension. Like you know, like he's probably going to die, but then you have him aware of we're in a dangerous situation how can we outplay them so you have leto going around trying to outmaneuver and like secure themselves and like he's winning the fremen's trust so it's like building up like oh you know what they're gonna be able to you know okay go i can this, see that go against this plot that they're aware is against them and then it's like the like all that hope is taken away and he is killed yeah, I, I could see it if it was like at the, you know, there's one time at the first, at the beginning of the book, where it's like Leto's going to die. And then it's not mentioned again, but it's just kind of like pounded into the your skull throughout the first part of the book, where I would have a really hard time as a reader not accepting he's going to die because I'm just told repeatedly, it's a good tragedy, like you say, like he is doing well. But for me, Leto is like a Ned Stark type character. I, he I guess, is. Yeah. you know, we, we do a little, this would be spoilers for Game of Thrones book one, season one. But, uh, you know, Ned is betrayed after being kind of this noble character who gets some people's trust and seems like a real stand up guy and he ultimately fails and dies. So I think Leto's really the same character there. Uh, I think it's more compelling in Game of Thrones because you don't know that he's going to get betrayed. It's a surprise. I, yeah, well, in Game of Thrones, you still have the same, you have the people plotting against them. Like, you know, the Lannisters are plotting yeah. against them. He's captured, he's sentenced to death, but you have this thought, oh, he's not going to 
he's not going to die. Like he's going to find some way around it. He's going to join John at the wall. Like right, that's a great. that's example of, of how I would think it would be well done. I, I I know I know, but there's still that tension. It's not like complete surprise. Like you're you're hoping for it. But and but I, the I thing is, there's not a prophetic nature. It's not like part of the narrative in Game of Game of Thrones. No, like no, you're no, not I being get, told it as fact that it's going to happen. Well, I, I get it's not done as like the same. And like Game of Thrones does a way better job of subverting your expectations there and and dropping mm -hmm. that on you. But at that point, I mean, at this point in the beginning of Dune, it isn't stated fact. You don't know, like, you don't know what the Bene Gesserit can do. You don't know what the Reverend Mother is infallible or anything. And it's giving okay. you, I feel like it's feeding you hope for you to, to think, oh, no, no, this is like, the story is going to be them overcoming this plot. And then it's all of a sudden, no, they were right. He's just dead. And okay. now you're in exile. I guess that's one way you could read it. But for me, the whole time I was thinking, okay, you know, these wise prophetic women know what they're doing. And so I should believe it. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that horse is beaten. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think the Benny Jesuit thing, it, one of the cooler things was the way that they implant the, the prophecies across the, mm -hmm. across the universe yeah. that Again, there would, you know, yeah. be these, be these rulers. And then Jessica and Paul are able to take advantage of that. That was a kind of a unique idea. I haven't come across before. That was really cool because it's cool to see that, like you say, Jake, maybe this is a situation where the prophecy is not really accurate. It's just kind of thrown out there. It's like a hook that, okay, our guys can use in the future if they ever need to. That's cool. Yeah, I feel like the yeah. second half of the book, prophecy is handled a lot better because you have, you're seeing it through Paul's perspective of him having seen this happen, but knowing that it could happen differently, like not knowing exactly how things are going to go down, wondering if there's anything he can do to change it, especially like the last duel he was a part of. He did not know if he was going to live or die because he saw so many mm -hmm. instances where he lived and so many instances where he died. And so I feel like, um, it got to the point in the book where this prophetic nature was a really cool uh, storytelling device. Whereas in the beginning of the book, it was it wasn't really used as that. But Go, going back to what we were saying before, and I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to rehash it, but I still think even if you <laughs> were 100% convinced, yeah, he's gonna die. Oh, there's still man. this this anticipation of, okay, things are gonna like go south real quick here, and you're like, so what's like. How is, how is Paul going to get out of this? Is Lady Jessica going to survive? What's going to happen? Like, okay. it's just setting up like this crap's about to go down and now you're just waiting for the, the fallout to begin. That's fair. And, and it's not like when Leto was betrayed, like I was sad and it was, you know, it, it was a, it was an exciting moment. It was an emotional moment. So I thought it was done pretty well. I just think it could have been a little more surprising to me. I feel like there's a there's another I don't know if it's a book or a show or a movie that does something similar where in the first like ten minutes, well Stephen King does this all the time. Like where maybe he'll tell you something that's going to happen, but it always happened. The thing with Stephen King is it always happens the way he says it's going to happen, but not the way that like you interpreted you it. Interpreted it. Maybe, mm. I think what I'm thinking is kind of similar to okay, this is Stormlight book four spoilers oh oh these are like uh, yeah, flashing let's, let's not these are like that, flashing red spoilers maybe can you talk about it with vague it was vague enough so it's not just, a spoiler i feel like the beginning of rhythm of war is a similar situation where you're like okay you know something bad is going to happen and then the anticipation is seeing how it happens and then okay how it, plays I can out, see some how it plays out from there like it's not like well, I just know this is going to happen. So there's no like tension anymore. It's, it's the, the anticipation is how is it going to happen? And then, okay, now what? Okay. Fair enough. That, fair enough. Fair enough. So, okay. It's something that we still see used from, <laughs> from Brandon Sanderson today. Okay. Good, good rebuttal. Okay. So once we get through book one, which is really a lot of setup and like Josh and I said, we were trying to kind of hang in there to be honest for, for the most part is all these guys and, and things were being introduced to us but book one ends with i thought an interesting i don't know if it was my favorite way to do this but paul just like levels up like crazy like all of a sudden he's having these visions he's smarter than his mother and he has all this knowledge that really is not possible for him to have it's it just gets way into the fantasy side the spice, of things man. <laughs> 
so that's all it is. It's just he was eating spice. It's it's the combination of his mentat training, him being whether he was intentionally or not the the Quiznos hacky sack. And then uh-huh. that being compounded with the spice stuff. You see the same thing happen with um, Lady Jessica and with Aaliyah as well. Okay. And with, I, and with all the Fremen, all the Fremen, well, not, they don't say all of them, but like multiple Fremen people will have, like, what's his name? Kini or Kaini? I can't remember how it's pronounced. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the, plan- the planetologist. The planetologist, like right before he dies, he has this uh-huh. like, out of body prim, like supernatural experience and it's from yeah he does consuming spice so much so it's just like the spice is a catalyst for that that's why the mintats like need it and the space or the space guild needs it um but that's just like the catalyst for unlocking all of paul's potential i think it's kinds is at least how they said it in the, uh, yeah i can't remember yeah for me it was just like too much too fast to have all of a sudden Paul is this like way overpowered guy. And the thing that really I didn't like as much was how emotionally detached he got. Like he cared zero about his father dying. He just immediately went to the strategic repercussions of it. And he just became kind of this alien character to me. Yeah. I mean, I I feel like that was foreshadowed with the whole, um, are you human or are you animal? Yeah, the in the beginning with the what's the name of the box thing? Uh, I don't remember the name of the box, but the poison like the Gamjabar. Gam, yeah, the Gamjabar. Yeah, like I think that's uh, it's just him being the with the Benny Jezeret training and the Mintat training, him being able to like overcome all that emotional stuff. But so he's supposed to be human, but uh, for me as a reader, I'm like this guy's not human. He's alien to me. I don't know. Maybe that's a commentary. It's supposed to be. I mean, the difference there between human and animal was supposed to be: Are you? Do you just react to your instincts, or are you basically are you acting, or are you being acted upon? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And and from what I've heard, the the future books kind of go more into uh, like we don't see Paul as much. Like we see kind of the downside of this this hero's arc. So in this book, yeah. you know, he's heroic and he becomes the savior and everything. It sounds like in the future, Herbert explores more of the, the downside of that. I don't know details because I haven't got into that more, but that's what I've been told. And that seems more intriguing to me because throughout this book, I'm like, okay, Paul is infallible. He can do nothing wrong. He wins everything. That's not super interesting to me all the time. So I'd be more interested to see how it goes wrong. I, th- I think it, I mean, it doesn't really show it like presently or currently, but to me, like the main again, like the main conflict for Paul is he has all this power, but he knows that it's very possibly leading, going to lead towards a destruction, like so much destruction across the whole universe. And so he's like, do I mm-hmm. use this to better my situation? And yeah, help that, that was interesting. Out? Yeah. And, and so like, even though he's like winning every time he like kind of levels up and overcomes his foes, it's like solidifying that He's, go- he's going further and further down that path that is leading towards this galaxy-wide jihad. I, so I, I did I, like that. I did like that, but sometimes I feel like it was just not done super well. Like the first time he had a duel with someone because he knocked him out or whatever, and then he was like, Jam- I challenge you to a duel. The Jameis and then, duel? Yeah. Jameis, and then yeah. he beats him in a duel and cries about it. Now he's like suddenly heralded as like the next hero. And I, I didn't really but know it, it was. I mean, I think it was kind of because he was also fulfilling these prophecies that were yeah, in they, place. They yeah. were already, they already kind of saw him as a religious figure before Leto was killed just because he was the son of Lady Jessica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it just, it just seemed weird. It seemed like we're coming up with excuses, like with scenes to have this happen you know have him become i could see it a little bit it's like okay he won this duel against this random fremen guy james like you know what what is all you know what is so important about this is yeah i I think the important thing there wasn't for him in his religious station and how they viewed him religiously but that 
by defeating him in the duel, then he partook of his body water and then he was accepted as a true freeman mm. or Fremen. I, don't, I honestly don't know how you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, but why? It's Fremen. But, Fremen. but that just seems so, I don't know if contrived is the right word, but like there was no foreshadowing that this was going to happen that I picked up on it at least. It well, I just... think it's, I feel like it was a pretty natural, he's, He's like part of the family that is kind of, depending on how you view it, subjugating the Fremen, you know, and outsiders ruling them. And so half, mm. like, like we mentioned earlier, half the Fremen see the, the trees outside of the palaces as hopeful for their, their lush green future they want. And the other half see mm. it as a sign of oppression. So I think it makes sense that they're Fremen who wouldn't like these outsiders that are now with them and just chalk them up to the same these are all just oppressors why are they here but how does winning a duel win those people over though like it it just kind of happens so he he kind of shows he's one of them yeah he changes from being an outsider to he's kind of like Jameis is kind of reborn in him that's why that's why Jameis's wife is like she comes to him and says hey i either have to be your wife or servant because basically like yeah, I, know, I, I interpret that as they see them as they kind of joined and he's become a Fremen now. Yeah. So now there's not that you're an yeah. outsider. But but to me, it just happened. It was like, oh, we need a way for him to gain some respect. Let's have him have a duel and win. And now he's, it just felt convenient to me. And I didn't really know uh-huh. why it was so, why he suddenly had so much respect again with the Fremen. I guess I just kind of saw this part of like the whole montage of of joining up and it's a trope that we've seen before, right? It's almost, I mean, some people be critical and say it's like the white savior type trope coming in and joining up and now becoming the leader of the, um, of the lesser group of people almost. I feel like it was a pretty natural progression for someone to want to fight him. And I also think like in world, there's reasoning for it causing them to accept him, but. And it's not like he becomes the leader at that point, Josh. Like there's still some yeah, time that has to happen. And yeah, he, he just accepted as a Fremen at that point. Yeah, you're right. He becomes the leader after the end of part two, but well, book two, um, when there's this time jump. I think it's a two year time gap, and all of a sudden uh, here we are in book three as we hurdle towards a climax. And now he's pretty much the leader. He's riding the sandworm. And he has this thing where he decides, I'm not going to kill Stilgar. I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, kind of change the the way that we run things here. In is the Fremen. Stilgar still the leader at that point, though? Uh, is he? Well, yeah. it's like Paul, maybe Stilgar is kind of like the his, his leader of the Fremen group, but Paul is now accepted as the Duke over all of Arrakis well, by at least the locals. Well, yeah, be- before that, it's like, I, I think at the beginning of, I can remember this is the end of book two or beginning of book three, but Paul is, is accepted as like this religious figure. Like they all, sure. all the Fremen all see him as that. And there's the faction of Fremen who want him to challenge Stilgar yes. in order to yeah. become both religious and their like lawful ruler. So like he still wasn't their, their ruler yet. He was just a religious symbol. And then, and then he decides if I can just ex- have them accept me politically according to the old system then that like Stilgar can still be the okay. leader you, yeah I might have been a little out of order there that that's probably right so I mean I, I don't know again I, I see it as like there's the time jump but I don't know it all just seemed plausible to me like over the years he becomes he's fulfilling more and more of these prophecies and he has this supernatural power to him it would make sense for them to see him as this messiah but those prophecies weren't like foreshadow prophecies at all, really. It was just like, oh, we're being told that he's fulfilling prophecies. To me, it wasn't very satisfying to watch him do watch him fulfill those. I think part of it is is just not us reading it the first time, not picking up on all the details towards the beginning of the book. Because I do remember a lot of those types of prophecies, and I was like, I don't know what the heck this is at the time. Well, it I think it's I think it's also just the nature of the prophecies that they were. It's kind of like this. I don't know if it's supposed to be like a like a an ironic twist or if it is like some sort of twist of fate that these most of these prophecies are just the ones that have been seeded by the reverend mothers to mm-hmm. benefit them 
for no other reason. And so is it just happenstance that he, like he is the, do- the son of a Bene Gesserit and then is uh-huh. powerful. So he's just like, like coincidentally fulfilling these main uh-huh. prophecies that are kind of vague to begin with. And so there's no reason to put faith behind him, but he's capitalizing on that. Or is it, oh, there's actually something more supernatural at play here. He is the Quiznos Hackisack and <laughs> is actually fulfilling the prophecy. And I, I really like that twist on prophecy because I think the straightforward prophecy of, okay, back, you know, the fantasy stories, back in the day, we said yeah. that someone would come and do this thing and here he is now and he's going to do all the things. That's played out. But, yeah. uh, you, you know, this is cool. Like back in 65, we had this twist on prophecy that uh, I really appreciated. I really like it. I do kind of think, I mean, maybe they did it before the AI war or whatever, like how did they reach these far off planets? That yeah, a lot, were... lot of unanswered questions like that, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Like how did they do that before? Like what would be the need of that if it was already a settled place? I don't know. I mean, I would even ask like, who are these Bene Gesserit people? Like, I just don't understand enough of the details. I said I, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Okay. So then in, in part three, uh, pretty much everything happens. So we, we have this raid on the, the Spicers and we meet up, we back up with uh, Gurney Halleck, who's been gone for a while, the old war master. And then the emperor's around. So we're going to go attack Wait, them. Real quick yeah. though. I did like this reunification with Gurney because it was an opportunity to see Paul like through his eyes again, you know? Yeah, like his see, new position now. You see the growth and see like, okay, well, there is still yeah. some of the old Paul in there, but now we see how, how much he's grown and how much he's like developed into his own as a leader. I yeah. also liked how like politically, Gurney, when Leto died, Gurney left believing that Lady Jessica was the spy. Like she was instrumental mm-hmm. to the betrayal so when they meet up again, he's like, what, how is she, like, how is she here? Like, I don't know, I thought that was like, I feel like most stories wouldn't let those kind of things play out. Whereas this was very much, no, this is how like things would happen. Mm-hmm. You know, you and can't he, just tie he basically tries to kill her thinking yeah. that he's gonna protect his, okay, but, but that whole thing, like terrible decision by Leto, I thought to not, uh, you know, cue in jessica to what's going on here like jessica is by far the most capable character throughout most of the book until paul uh gets way overpowered and, and can know everything but jessica's awesome throughout the book and i don't know why if if i'm uh duke leto why would i not cue in my wife here to everything she's much smarter than i am obviously i think i think it's just that kind of you need some sort of like mistrust not mistrust but you need some sort of like disconnect communication wise in order to have conflict i think his justification was if like i need to do this so that way the people who think that that i really believe this believe that i believe this if that makes sense like to to not give it away that the that that plot had been ruined so that way he could follow it out and in his mind the only way to do that was to make her believe it as well I mean, I'm fine with it as a plot point. I just think it was a bad decision on his Definitely part. bad decision, yeah. And I, th- I said wife, mistakenly. She's actually not his wife. That's an important thing. Yeah. Concubine. <laughs> yes, the, the concubine. <laughs> Concubines. <laughs> All right, so now we go into the, the final fight here, which happens really quickly. And we just kind of wrap up everything with with the Harkonnens and the, and the Emperor and everything. Um, I think there's some reason to be a little critical here. It just, it just happened too quickly. And I thought that with all that happened here, this definitely could have been drawn out and been, been more dramatic. I mean, Paul wins over all of our enemies that we've seen for some amount of time throughout the whole book, but it's just done so fast. Yeah, I thought it was like really cool that happened, but again, just not, like it didn't get the time it, it deserved. And this could be just a time thing. Like if you look at The Hobbit, how... Like, how long does the Battle of Five Armies last? Book-wise, yeah, that's fair. You know, it and lasts like a maybe, whole movie. Yeah, it lasts a whole they made, movie. They made a whole like, movie about it. But 
and like that that was a way bigger conflict you know I think just at the time especially for science fiction I don't know like action wasn't really paramount in the storytelling yeah this is definitely not an action book and actually I mean you mentioned Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit but kind of similar when you go back and read the Lord of the Rings books action is not a focus like if you're if you're looking for a series that's action heavy reading Lord of the Rings is not going to give you that the the battles are are really like like Isengard is like oh okay and same thing yeah 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 yeah, exactly um as is Helm's Deep which is one of the most awesome scenes in you know in in fantasy movie yeah. yeah and it's just kind of like a few pages and it's done and and, and it's in mostly, my most recent reread i was shocked to realize that yeah and mostly it's them going further further back into the caves and like talking to the orcs you know <laughs> like than actually fighting yeah and i think you get similar stuff here like the the conversation with his sister with Aaliyah mm-hmm. and the emperor and harkonnen i i want to say that whole thing that whole sequence took longer than any of the following action yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think the climax is awesome for a lot of reasons, though. Um, just the idea, just the like envisioning all the Fremen riding up on their sandworms and, yeah. and storming it. And like the, I thought the plot was cool. Like, oh, we'll take down their shields and then do this and like disable their ships and, and the, the black, I guess basically blackmailing the spice guild by saying we'll blow up all the spice if you don't mm-hmm. yeah um, whoever controls the destro- whoever's able to destroy something is who really controls it yeah that was a cool theme throughout the book yeah and then i don't know i just the whole like how how he outmaneuvered the emperor i thought was pretty cool even though it's one of those things like oh yeah you won and then you realize well now you've like guaranteed like the thing you were trying to prevent this whole book that's weighing over your head now it's like outside of your control mm-hmm. and it would be interesting to read the follow-up this i mean this makes me want to read the follow-up books and really understand where this goes from here like does paul fall as a leader how does it happen do we get into the the jihad that he's been trying to prevent i'm, I'm interested i don't know if i'm really compelled so, to read a lot more of the series but uh, okay my criticism of this whole thing is i i like the idea that there's he's trying to balance getting out alive and like protecting those that he loves with preventing this jihad the thing is is that he never ever like chooses to sacrifice something over preventing this jihad like it's it's always okay well i'm just gonna do it and i know that it doesn't seem to really care all that much for the people he he loves he says he he says it's important to him but you never see preventing the jihad like be important to him well I, i mean you could kind of spin it the other way like he's everything he does is to protect his family and and the fremen yeah and but- so you could see you could say it's like like it's more his caring for them that causes him to not be careful for the future fine but then that's uh, not really like a dec- i feel like it would have been a much more interesting like a much when he was like having to choose between lady jessica and preventing the jihad like having to put that choice to a test and whereas you never really believe that he's going to do anything to try and stop this jihad even though he's more says of a it's his more of a uh, batman begins type thing yeah or dark knight yeah it's, it's kind of a theme to, for batman <laughs> i don't know i feel like i feel like again it was the here's something that there's this threat looming over and then the assumption is he's going to somehow come out victorious and prevent it. Like he's going to, he's going to outsmart it somehow. He doesn't do anything to do that though. He just talks about it and like kind yeah. of navel gazes about it. Like, Oh, I don't want this to happen, but every decision I make is going to make this happen. Even though I know I could make a different decision and not make it like, well, the different decisions it. are hurting those he loves though. I know, but he, there's never really like, he, there's never really, you'd never believe that he's going to make that other decision and he he's not willing to sacrifice anything for it so his son dies maybe it would have been more interesting if there was was a a reason yeah if there was a reason why that happened like josh said like he had to choose to sacrifice his his son uh, in order to, to stop the jihad or something like that yeah yeah i mean follow up 
he doesn't seem to care yeah. all that he's much like, that oh, his son I'll, dies. I'll more sons. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, Cheney will bear me many more sons. No problem. <laughs> okay, man. Is that, is that how they pronounce it in the audiobook, Cheney? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'm looking cool- forward to her being a bigger character in the movie Zendaya is playing her, so... I imagine that will be a larger role. I thought she didn't get enough time, but I, it was like suggested that she was a cool character, but there wasn't quite enough for me to really buy it in the book. But I think she is. Yeah, you could tell she was like capable. She definitely wasn't just this, like now you're my wife. Like she had her own stuff, yeah. but it was like all off screen. I think a cool theme of the book is, and stemming back to like the inspiration for the book was Frank Herbert watching the US government try to stop sand dunes from growing, I think in Oregon yeah, or I think something. Heard that. And so they would plant, I don't know if it was crabgrass or different like plants to try to hold the earth together to prevent it from all just turning into dunes. Mm. And, and so obviously that inspired like dune, the planet as its own. But I think the idea of like fighting against nature and then whether whether the change you you make to fight against it is actually better mm-hmm. or worse off than the original thing. And I feel like that theme comes up a lot, like with, with uh, Paul himself, like, you know, his whole thing is, should I fight against my nature or, you know, like what is going to be, what's a worse outcome? And then also the, uh, with the Fremen, their whole idea is we're going to turn this planet into like a lush garden. Yeah. But, by doing that, that would destroy the spice, right? Yeah, I have a question so, on that. So in order to do this, they're like storing up these vast stores of water. And it's like, once they get enough water, they're going to be able to do it. I, I, did yeah, I miss I think, something? Like, how I, I think does they just the want water... to jumpstart the water cycle? <laughs> like, yeah. That's what I guess that's just really think... like a very soft sci-fi there of like, once we get enough water, we're going to be able to do it. And it's never really explained, but maybe that's... I have no idea how that would work on the atmosphere. Like you would think that without that much moisture in there, then the atmosphere would be totally different. And like water wouldn't like the water cycle would not work the same way, but that's what I got is that they were just going to let the water flow. And then it was going to, (laughs) yeah, there must be some other technology at play. they, they, They show in the palaces, like if you have enough water, you can get these plants to grow. Yeah. But that, I mean, if you bring out the water to the surface and it's just going to evaporate, like, is that really going to change the planet? I mean, there's there's been efforts to... to, Stephen, it evaporates and then forms a cloud and then it falls. Yeah, but like long term, this is going to change the entire scape of the planet to be a Garden of Eden? I mean, it's it's their like prophetic dream. Like, who knows if it's possible? But my, my whole, my only point was this is some change they want to make, but also it would completely change their way of life. There wouldn't be any, like the sandworms couldn't survive. The spice, doesn't the spice dissolve with water? Like all this stuff would, um, like it would completely destroy their lifestyle, but it's their goal to do this. And this question is not really answered in this book, but in my skimming of the Wikipedia of future books, uh, it is a theme that continues to come up. So that would be an interesting thing worth reading further in. I would like to see how, what they do there. Hmm. Okay, uh, that was a pretty good talk through the plot. I mean, I think there are a few maybe loose ends we didn't cover, but uh, let's go to our worst of the best segment. So if you're listening to the podcast, Michael Kramer and Kate Redding are going to read that in now. So like they said, the idea is for us to pick up something we liked, but then nitpick and Um, as we like to do, be a little critical on it. Uh, Who wants to start? I'll go. For for me, um, the lack of any really uh, compelling antagonist was a thing that I didn't love about this book. Mm. (laughs) Um, Even though I think it, and the best of this is that I think this was another thing that inspired Star Wars of like, um, I kind of in my head would likened um harkonon oh, and the emperor Har- Har- well i i was thinking harkonon and like darth vader of being like this kind of lower level level lackey and then uh-huh. he gets he gets uh killed but then oh now we have to take out the emperor who's the real challenger okay and I, darth I, vader's I saw, related and, I and even darth vader is his uh gra- i mean and this it's his grandfather but right you, you know 
So I think the best is that it inspired one of the best antagonists that like fiction has ever seen. <laughs> but in this, like there's never any real antagonist that I thought was going to be a serious problem for Paul. I mean, Tarkinon causes problems for Leto, obviously. Yeah, so, so, that there, so there's other things and there's like political machinations that were compelling and that I thought did a good job, but there's no character that when they came on the screen, I was like, oh boy, like this is going to be bad it, or mm. that gave me real chills or made me really concerned for okay. uh, Paul. Um, yeah. So, so I think that the, the worst was the lack of really, really any real um, great antagonist, but the best part of that was, I feel like in my head canon, it inspired some of the best antagonists. I feel like Harkonnen inspired Jabba the Hutt more than Darth Vader. I, I mean, yeah, but but like you, you get what I'm, I'm saying though. Yeah, like with, yeah, yeah. He's fat, right? That, that's like a yeah. He has like suspenders that hold him up. Right? Yeah, and he, I don't he know does seem pretty bumbling. Book. Yeah, in the in the movie, he has this little like floating thing because he, he can't walk. He's like basically all the guys in uh, Wally. Wally. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Okay, Jake, did you have one? I, th I think the my worst of the best is just the, the ending because it has so many cool parts to it. The like their strategy and how it's executed and the out politicking and the duel at the end I thought was cool because they've set okay. up how um, the Harkonnen nephew is like, he always cheats in his duels. So you're like, oh, he's going to cheat and win. Fade Rautha. Yeah, Fade Rautha. Yeah. You're like, oh, like he always cheats so what's going to happen and then paul just owns him anyways and mm -hmm. the ominous like how ominous it is at the end i think all those things are cool but it just happens so fast that all these cool things happen like right after each other you didn't really have a chance to really i don't know appreciate them to their fullest yeah i'm with you there that could definitely could have been strung out a little bit more and i would have liked it more Okay, mine is, I'm kind of going off you with uh, the Fade Rautha reference. And I'm going to say side characters in general. I thought the best was like these guys, all of the side characters, all of the kind of, you know, C tier characters, the uh, ancillary characters will say the pieces were all in place there. They, they played different roles, but I never felt like they were developed quite enough or if they were, they were taken off really quickly. Like Duncan Idaho, who it seems like a cool concept. It's you just, just got you're just mad because you got played on Discord about Duncan. Yeah, I did. Idaho. I did get played on, on our Discord. Uh, I was led to believe that Duncan Idaho was going to be cool, <laughs> and then I was like, "What the heck? He's dead and he's gone." He was cool. Um, there yeah. is stuff with him in future books, so maybe that's what was being referred to actually. But uh, oh. he he's dead here, and the same with uh, same with Kynes. Kynes was cool, and then he's dead and he's gone and. Honestly, people care zero the fact that he's gone, which I thought was strange. But uh, you know, and, and Howett and Halleck, like they're they're important characters, but I, I just never was attached to them quite as as much as maybe um, I would have liked to have been. And I think Fade Rautha, especially for the role he plays in dueling Paul at the very end, like the very tail end of the climax, this guy was not in the book very much. And I think he had the potential to be cool because he was basically set up to be a foil to Paul, where he was also very powerful and kind of you know he same age. A, he he could have been the yeah he could have been Hatterach. he could have been the Quiznos hacky sack yeah. as you say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's, they're like the only they, two people in the universe, right? Is what they said. Like out of trillions and trillions of people, like only these two could have been the the hacky sack of the Quiznos. Sure, yeah, yeah this. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, because they were because they're bo both yeah. sons of uh <laughs> Benny Gesserit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who were trained as, yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly, I don't want to mess it up, but yeah, yeah, all of that terminology, all of that terminology goes right into this, anyway. <laughs> it was like the idea is awesome, but at the same time, you're like, uh, wait, who's this guy? We've seen him one time, we know he cheats at duels, and so we're fighting was, now, but he was kind of, I feel like he had a couple. Was it just one other on screen? There were a like couple times where, where he, he was certainly he was, mentioned with the Baron. He was always kind of yeah. part of his plan. The thing yeah. is, I never even got that he was a real great fighter because he would have lost the duel had he not used the like safe word or whatever yeah. to, to handicap the slave. 
So well, yeah, but he would he usually cheated with like poison or something. Yeah, but but I was like never. I was like, if Paul loses to this guy who can't even beat a random slave in like a in like a match, then what's this all for? You know. So but, I mean, cool, you, you know he's but... cheating though, so it's not just. A... I I know I I get that, but he wasn't built up to be a really. He wasn't built up to be super yeah, competent he wasn't... villain like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he wasn't really a threat. I thought that, like, I still think that the fight was cool and, like, like, oh, with, how is he gonna cheat? But mm -hmm. he, at that point, Paul is Paul's the god of Dune, basically. So, yeah, not even basically. Like, he literally is. He's the Messiah of Dune for sure. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, that's fine. I think we kind of have beat that idea into the ground. So overall, I think we're all in agreement. 10 out of 10, best <laughs> book ever. Now, for me, it's probably an 8 out of 10. I really like it. I think it's it's got such good themes in it and the execution of it and these like subversions of the heroes and chosen one tropes. Okay. And the politics are great. I think like Josh, you know, kind of going back to what Josh said at the beginning, it's, it's a little tough to rate because 50 plus years old, some of these ideas, you know, at the time were, were probably a little more, uh, I don't know, impactful or cutting edge. And now we're looking back and thinking like, I've read all this other stuff. And some of these ideas are done better by other authors, frankly. Uh, for me, like just this most recent read, how much did I enjoy it? It's probably like a 6.5 out of 10. If I'm going to look at it from more like an artistic and, um, and it, it level of influence it's had across the genre, then I could bump it up to an eight for you, Jake. Dan, can I summon Daniel Green right now and just have him? I feel like he, he'd be a lot more eloquent and, and destroying no, he, your guys' opinions. I, I don't know. I, go, go watch his Dune review. I did watch it. He, he didn't I'm love not. it the first time you read it. Oh, okay. Well, expect um, to reread that. Daniel, if, Dan, if the great Daniel Green can agree with me. I just knew, I just knew he really liked it. So, but um, I didn't yeah, so so I feel like I'm gonna go. I'm gonna split the difference, and I think seven out of ten. I guess that's not really splitting the difference, but um, you I, could say I seven point two five. Seven <laughs> seven point two five out of ten. It was like I enjoyed reading it, though. I, I enjoyed um, being in the world, and I I really liked it. I just thought that there are some things that were really clunky. Um, the way that I experienced the the reading of it not saying that if I went back and did another reread that I wouldn't have my mind changed on that or that that's gospel. Just, I feel like um, it didn't flow as a modern story that I'm used to reading flows. Um, so anyway, that's, yeah, I'll do 7.25 and split your guys' difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to another episode of Phantology. If you're uh, watching on YouTube, you can see I have the, uh, the book, prominently featured here in the background. This is one of the books that won in our top three book covers competition a few months ago. So if you follow us on Twitter, uh, you can play along with some things we do right now. In the month of February, we're doing top three fantasy romances. That's going to start soon. By the time this episode comes out, it'll probably already be rolling, but follow us there and vote. If you want to talk with us more and tell us why all our Dune opinions are wrong, or if you liked them, you know, let us know that as well. You can find our Discord invites on the episode descriptions and on the internet at www.fantasybooks. Not fantasy books, at www.fantologybooks.com. <laughs> we got fantasy where, books. That would. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know where that, that will take you, but. <laughs> Check our, our layout. You'll see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look uh, right and left of our, of our smiling faces right now, and you will see. All that stuff. If you want to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Okay, until next time. See you guys. Yep. See ya. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our Discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all.